Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of Thoughts May Vary. This feels very weird because Meadow is not doing this intro with me because she's having weird technical difficulties with her microphone. And I've never talked to the camera by myself over here. So, hey, how are you? I'm so excited for you guys to hear today's episode. We have another part two for you guys. This time it's featuring the amazing Joanna Kandel. Joanna is the founder of the National Alliance for Eating Disorders, the leading national nonprofit organization that provides referrals, education, and support for individuals experiencing eating disorders and their loved ones as well. You guys loved when we first had Joanna on. My God, when was it? Like a year ago almost, I feel like. We just learned so much from her. She's so insightful and has such beautiful information to give every single one of us. So this time around, we thought it would be fun to ask you guys, our amazing community, to give us questions that you've been thinking about. And we referred those on to Joanna and she gave us her amazing responses. So it's pretty much a little Q&A. We got to catch up with her in the beginning about when we saw her at the UN, which if you follow Meadow and I on Instagram, you saw us posting all about. We were so honored to be there. I don't even want to blab on more for you because this is such an amazing jam-packed episode that I hope you all enjoy. Here's our conversation with Joanna. Joanna, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me again. You are both two of my most favorite humans of this whole entire world. And I got to see you in person at the beginning of the month, which was so phenomenal, amazing, and just made my heart so happy. Tell everybody what that event was because Meadow and I can't stop talking about it. It was the I best know. thing we've ever been to <laughs> and could not believe that we would not stop room. yelling about it, truly. <laughs> yeah. A little bit over a decade ago, we were talking about incidence rates, not only of eating disorders in this country, but across the globe. And we know that that, that eating disorders are not like a US-based disorder. We know that they affect everyone. And so I had this idea to do an event at the United Nations to bring awareness about eating disorders. It was sort of a, uh, like a pipe dream, like sort of like, yeah, one day I'm going to like, you know, do this and ha ha, sure. Literally um, in April, we got the go-ahead to do an event at the United Nations in the, the Delegate Stein Room for World Eating Disorder Action Day, which was on June 2nd. We did a luncheon and briefing. So for the first time in the history of the UN, eating disorders were discussed. And it was just, I mean, I really have so many words and no words at all about it. It was one of those yeah. moments where okay. for so long, individuals in our world didn't have a voice. A lot of times they don't feel like they deserve to be seen, heard. We were taking up space that day and yeah. we were creating conversations, primarily ensuring that eating disorders are part of the general mental health conversation. Mm -hmm. And we also called in several of the social media companies. We had folks from Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, Pinterest were in the room and we talked about some of the harms that, that are happening in social media mm -hmm. and calling them in to say, hey, you know, we know that social is incredible and amazing and call in creates community. And it's also doing harm. So how do we work mm -hmm. together to make it a safer experience for everyone? Totally. I think we told you this when I was there, but to tell you again, just, I feel like I have to tell you everything because I, you know, when you're the hostess, it's like, I feel like I need to, to uh, download about the whole day with you again. But you know, my mom framed the invite. Oh yeah. I literally framed it for us. Like, I like, loved that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's right across from yeah. me. I see it over there. <laughs> it was such an incredible opportunity and experience to be in that room. It was just such a palpable feeling of compassion and yes, care and empathy. Totally. And it was so intentionally done. Yeah. Every conversation, every panel, you know, the keynote speaker, mm -hmm. like everything was done so intentionally and definitely felt like something where when you leave the work isn't mm -hmm. done. Yeah. And I know that yeah. was like a theme, but you know, Meadow and I have gone to a lot of events that like you go, it's great. It's a great convo and you leave and you never mm -hmm. talk about it again. And that really felt like everyone walked out empowered, having more tools mm -hmm. to know what to do to further the mission and further the conversation. That's such a testament to you and your team. And even more questions. Like you and I walked away yeah. with having been asked a couple of questions that day or like thought starters that we've unpacked on the podcast totally. and like mm -hmm. still ruminated on and are thinking on. Like it mm -hmm. was yeah, it felt like a good think tank too. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. That is some of the kindest feedback that anybody could ever give, um, oh. by the way. Um, but that's really what we wanted. We didn't want to do just an event to hold an event. We wanted to mm -hmm. have people leave with like a call to action. So not only yeah. 
join yeah. the conversation, be part of the conversation, but also to continue the conversation. You know, even though eating disorders are serious mental illness, they are biopsychosocial illnesses, yet they're often left out of the general mental health conversation. I cannot even tell you how often like I'm in a room with other general mental health advocates, providers, and they look at me like, what are you doing here? Like, we don't understand. Mm. Even, I mean, folks from like the suicide community that do such important yeah. work you know, when we yeah. first approach them and say, hey, can we work together? Can we collaborate? And they're like, why? And it's like, well, you know, the number one leading cause of death for eating disorders is death by suicide. Um, individuals mm -hmm. that have eating disorders and substance use disorders have the highest rates of suicide. And it's like, mm -hmm. if you're not talking about this, you are alienating a whole group of the community. And it's going to take all of us all of us to push this needle forward. And I really appreciated the executive director of the Mental Health Coalition, Jen Moore. You know, she used her platform to say, don't just expect us at MHC to be the conduit to the conversation with the eating disorder community. It's going to take every organization in the room to have these conversations. It's been really empowering and wonderful because we have had relationships with them before, but just the conversations we're having now after, they genuinely want to bring in this this conversation on eating disorders, disordered eating, you know, diet culture, fat phobia, weight stigma, like we're having these mm -hmm. really important and necessary conversations. And you're watching the change happen through conversation yeah. to conversation. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, we have so far to go still, but just to be able to even have a, a place in the conversation is mm -hmm. a game changer. And it's going to oh. take all of us. And this is so much bigger than just me or, or, or the Alliance. It's going to take all of us and a whole lot more of us too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Man. We are so honored that you're back and continuing the conversation here on the podcast as well. As I was mentioning before we started recording, our audience was so excited to know that you are coming back. If you guys are new to the podcast or maybe you missed it, this is Joanna's second time on the pod and we could not be more excited. Please go check out that first episode. We oh learned gosh, so many good so, tools in there. So many good tools. It was so actionable and just so jam-packed with information. This episode, we definitely wanted to open up to the community because we got such great feedback from that episode and people just came rolling in with the questions. So today we really wanted to give our audience the platform mm -hmm. to be able to ask you all of their amazing questions. But before we dive into those, because we have so many, you know, since you've been here before, we start all of our episodes by asking our guests what they're currently unpacking. So Joanna, what are you currently unpacking right now? I think right now I'm unpacking a lot of the politics that not only exist within my field, within the eating disorder community, but in our world currently. I think I live in Florida. Um, and, and I say that ugh, I live in Florida. <laughs> I'm from Miami. Um, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm, yep, so I, get you. Um, I, I have a very heavy heart for living mm -hmm. in the state that I do live in, especially yeah. with so many of the folks that I live, um, that, that I love so dearly are, are trans, non-binary, mm -hmm. um, queer. Um, also, I'm also unpacking some of the rulings that have come out of like the Supreme Court, like today's Supreme Court about reversing affirmative action. That just really hurts my heart. And then within like our eating disorder community, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of things that have happened. I'm sure many of y'all have read a lot about it in the news. So trying not to, trying not to get stuck in the heaviness of everything and to try to mm. find ways in which I can show up and I can help trying to remember, you know, Mr. Rogers and that, that reminder of, you know, when things are really overwhelming, look for the helpers and just trying to see how I can show up and help. Do you have a go-to like coping strategy for days that the news is heavy as well? Mm. Before you try to channel the energy into showing up, what's like a go-to boundary or coping? Um, so really bad television. I would say, I think I've said oh, that yeah. last time, yes. like oh, yeah. really bad television, um, <laughs> yeah. spending time with my nugget, my, my little kiddo yeah. and listening to audiobooks right now. If you haven't read or listened to or read Viola Davis's book, I know I'm a little bit late to the party. It is a game changer. Like she is everything. And I do dabble in adding things to my proverbial shopping cart quite a bit. So <laughs> I literally texted my friend that last night. I said, I'm online window shopping, which means I, I make a bunch of carts and then yep. I leave. <laughs> yep. So it's Incredible. my coping yep. literally yep. last yep. night. Yeah. It's so good. It's so good. 
Mm-hmm. It's so good. I did that when I, my first job out of college, I would have some moments where I just had not much to do because I was somebody's assistant. So like some days were crazy, some days weren't. Sure. And on those moments, I would always go on this one website and I would just like do that in window shop. And then I felt really excited when something would update on the website because I felt like I knew the back end of the website. And I was like, oh my God, new. What's what's going on here? Or all of a sudden. I could tell you that website. Like the or back all of, my of a hand. sudden it's like, hey, mm-hmm. you're the item you've been looking at is now 50% off. And you're just yeah. like, imagine yeah. that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> exactly. Yep. It's a great time. We got a lot of questions that people, regardless of what mental health moment they're in, can relate to this like deep feeling of frustration when it comes to like, I have the self-awareness or I talk about this all the time with my therapist and like nothing, like what do I, like, come on, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Mm -hmm. So somebody asked, I'm sick of talking about my ED because nothing has changed even after talking about it a lot. Mm -hmm. Any advice? Yeah. I feel like you were in my, my therapy session with me last week is is what I want to say. And not so much around my, my eating disorder. I think more, more general. Um, Totally. You know, I have, in addition to my my experience with my eating disorder, I have uh, a, a generalized anxiety disorder diagnosis, which doesn't go away. Like just, I mean, it didn't go away for me is what I would say. Yeah. I was telling my, my therapist is I know every single tool I need to do. And I'm still feeling mm-hmm. this way. I am so angry. I am so overwhelmed. I don't understand why I can't already. Like I am beating myself up for not doing better in how I react to X, Y, and Z. And what I, what I know to be true with my anxiety, but also when I was, you know, experiencing my eating disorder is it was just an opportunity for my eating disorder to continue to take hold, meaning it was just more fuel Mm. for the fodder for me to continue to act out in my eating disorder. Mm. I also want to say that recovery happens in these extremely little micro steps that when you're looking out and you're looking at the extreme, you can't see it. And it gets very frustrating. Mm -hmm. You're like, nothing has changed. Absolutely nothing has changed. But then when you go in a a little, a little more, more micro, you're like, okay, I actually stopped before I engaged in X, Y behavior, Mm -hmm. or I reached out to someone. I still possibly acted out, but I still did these, not taking away these, these wins, which we could potentially call them small, but they're really not small. Yeah. So number one, giving yourself, and I know I talk about this a lot, but giving yourself grace and that the journey to recovery with whatever you're recovering for is extremely difficult. It's some of the hardest shit that you will ever do in your life. And second is, is, is give yourself the space to not minimize the wins that you are doing because mm-hmm. these tiny little baby steps are going to turn into these like really giant leaps. And yet when we're so fixated on the all or nothing, the black or white of this or that, we're not able to see that um, nuance. So allow yourself to lean into the messy, the overwhelmingness, but also to be cognizant of, of, of all the things that you are doing. Mm-hmm. We recorded earlier today and we had a little bit of a break before our recording. Yeah. And so I was like, let me run and take my dog on a dog walk real quick. And we walked around the park and there's this guy like doing all these stretches or whatever. And so when I made it around, I saw him and I was like, oh, you're making me, you're reminding me I should go home and do my stretches. He was like, oh, it's, you know, it's my PT. I have like a pulled rotator cuff, whatever, whatever. It's so painful, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. That's brutal. Like, you know, I hope, I hope that helps and feels better. He's like, nope, not today, but I'm here buying time just doing it. And I was literally, and I was like, oh my gosh, well, you, you inspired me to do it too, whatever. And I walked away. And I was walking back thinking like, God, is that not just such a beautiful allegory for how all the healing yeah. we do feels like shit sometimes it in real time. terrible. And I think that that was the, the biggest like misnomer for me in recovery was like, oh, oh yeah. like switching out like a healthful coping, coping tool as opposed to like acting out in your eating disorder is going to feel great. And I was like, this feels mm. like shit. Like, yeah. For folks that are listening, I'm not saying that it's not that, that recovery is is everything. Like recovery has given me right. so much, but like if we set ourselves up to think that like the journey to recovery is going to be sunshine, bunnies, and rainbows, like we're gonna be yeah. so not we're gonna be so mm-hmm. surprised. And like recovery is hard. Like it's actually oh hard work. And sometimes it's gonna feel effective, and sometimes it's not. Just like you know that that human at, at the park of like this might not feel good or might not feel like it's doing anything, but yet it's that consistency that's showing up, that doing that work that's so important. My coach taught me like the phrase, like taking inventory, Yeah. literally taking inventory when you feel like you've done Mm -hmm. nothing and you've accomplished nothing, write those things down because like 10 out of 10 times you actually did do something. (laughs) 
which is also why healing and community is just the way to do it because when it doesn't get easier and like we said earlier, Gabby, we're doing this for the rest of our lives. Like you have to work on yourself for the rest of your life. So you might as well talk yeah. to a buddy about it because it makes it a lot easier to get through it together. Oh yeah. We need community. We need it. We're not meant to do this alone. And it's some of the hardest work that I ever had to do was to ask for help. And I think that that's, yeah. that's yeah. you know, that's a lot of what I hear a lot from our community is like, it's so hard to reach out for help. I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to, whatever words, you know, that, that you are hearing right. internally, we're just not supposed to do this on our own. We're not supposed to do this by ourselves and just to be able to be. And I think that for me, going back to, you know, that, that, that room at the UN and, and there were so many diverse and, and beautiful humans in that space. There was a lot of people that were missing as well that I would have loved to have had. But in that moment, like, I felt like we were in this together, that we're, we were, we were walking together. And when you get into a space, whether it's in person or virtual, where individuals are speaking your language, it takes away some of that isolation and loneliness that so often mental illness, you get overwhelmed with. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any tips for navigating that conversation? Because one of our next questions, it's kind of a two-parter, mm -hmm. but one was, early signs to tell if I'm relapsing. And the follow-up to it was when I know I'm relapsing, how do I open up to my partner or friend about it? Mm. Ooh, um, right. That is, I mean, oh, I just, I feel I that in my, in my, in my, in my, in my heart, accountability is the reason why I'm sitting here today. And I'll be very direct mm. and Vulnerability and accountability are two, so two of the hardest things for me to, to really lean into. But I think so often what would happen is I would be so afraid of letting folks know or, or my floaties in a sense, let them know what was really going on, that I would have like a slip or a trip and I wouldn't say anything because, you know, I wanted, you know, I wanted everyone to think I was doing fine, that I was okay. And I wanted to keep this image of like, she's great. She's recovered. She's la 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 la. Lots of momentum going. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I had so much shame around slips and trips. And so I would have another yeah. slip and trip and then I would be like, oh, I can't tell anybody. And then I would find myself fully immersed in a lapse or relapse when I was finally able to get access to care or like, you know, at that time, my best friend, they were like, why didn't you say anything? Like if you would have told me that first time you would have had that like little wiggle or that little like, you know, trip, I, we could have helped. And, you know, so it was getting over in a sense, like my shame around the fact that it wasn't going to be a linear journey because the journey to recovery mm -hmm. is absolutely not going to be linear. So I think accountability and inviting people in to say, Hey, if you noted X, Y, and Z, like I would love for you to be able to just check in with me. And if I deflect, which I'm really good at, come back, you know, or yeah. uh, honestly, some of the stuff that worked best for me, and this is, you know, I started my recovery journey before people really had cell phones, like they had like, re like, mm. record, like they had voice recorders, like with tapes, like I would call up like my therapist and say, I did this just now, or this is how I've been doing. I probably won't admit it to you when I see you next but I'm just mm. telling you, like I had these moments of like what I would consider bravery mm. and I would, I would call myself oh, out yeah. mm. or I'd write it down on a piece of paper and I would hand it to them because I wasn't able to vocalize cool. it to them. So having yeah. folks that you can be accountable mm. to, I think, and your willingness to be accountable, texting someone, you know, just finding one way of, of just like mm -hmm. sharing what was really going on for any of y'all that are having slips and trips know that this is not a reflection of who you are as your character. I oftentimes like to compare it to physical health. And, mm -hmm. you know, when individuals are going through treatment for physical health, when something doesn't work, it's not something about them that's not okay. It's just about the treatment that, that, that didn't work. I invite you to step into that space of like, this is not like a moral failure because you need additional treatment or you need another form of treatment or you need more treatment. It's not about you not being whatever enough it's just that you need more access to care full mm -hmm. stop mm -hmm. you know because I think that there's so mm -hmm. there's also so much shame in oh I was doing okay and then like I had a relapse I can't believe I did that it's like cool like we just need to lay out more of a foundation or oh I can't believe I have to go to treatment again uh, if, they, if you are able to have access there's nothing morally wrong with you it's just you need more care yeah 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 kind of a tangential question but we've been talking a lot about this recently especially in terms of like feelings of shame or guilt and all that jazz. 
have, have, what are your thoughts on exploring shadow work in tandem with ED support? I am a firm believer in, I'm so happy that there's not one, one type of treatment or experience. Totally. I totally. think that, mm-hmm. you know, for some folks, like family-based therapy works for them where, you know, their totally. loved one is the one who takes the helm with, with refeeding. Some individuals like, like um, radically open DBT works. I'm fully mm-hmm. an over-controlled human. So for me, RODBT works really, really well for me. Oh, cool. I've never met a chain analysis. I have not loved, even though I will kick yeah. and scream every single step of the way. So I think, you know, um, internal family systems, like I think like any yeah. type of like shadow work, any time, any type of experience that is egocentric that works really well, I think absolutely, mm. absolutely lean into it. Yeah, cool. Mm. The next question that we got, I resonated a lot with because I know, of course, adding a late labels can be so helpful. They can be so helpful. And at the same time, I think they can also have people floating in the gray Mm -hmm. where they don't Mm -hmm. know where they are. And I know that's something that I experienced a lot, particularly just like comparing with friends who are also going through similar things. So somebody asked, any thoughts or advice for those who fall into disordered eating, but not full ED? You are deserving of help and support, full stop. That's exactly what I would say. You don't need a formal diagnosis. You do not need to fit criterium for X, Y, and Z in order to warrant um, being supported, being seen, being valued, and being helped. I have a lot of issues with a lot of like, what's in the DSM, for example. I was, um, yeah. we got a question about which, that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I will go ahead and address now because it is one of my most favorite impassioned topics is, mm-hmm. you know, I am so angered by so much of the criterion, mm-hmm. for example, between anorexia nervosa and otherwise, um, you know, otherwise specified feeding and eating disorders in which atypical anorexia um, exists. There is um, a weight criterion with anorexia nervosa where there is, you know, with atypical anorexia, it's, there's not that same, there's like a reduction of weight, but not that, that low weight. I think it's shrouded in, in fat phobia and weight stigma mm-hmm. because we know factually that individuals that experience atypical anorexia have just as many health issues and folks that, that experience low weight anorexia nervosa, and yet they're treated so much different um, when it comes mm-hmm. to intervention, when it comes to access to care, when it comes to insurance coverage. I mean, when it comes to nutritional rehabilitation, there's so there's so much discrimination. There's so there's so much, and so I think um, you know, again, coming de- back to this idea of because you don't have this diagnosis, doesn't mean that that you're not worthy of getting the help and support. Is just just awful, just terrible. Like individuals need need help and support, whether you fit criterion to a label or not. Then on the flip side, and we actually were just talking about labeling today at the office of like how how labels can be helpful in some ways and how they can be very harmful in others. Like, you know, mm-hmm. um, one of the things that that like, for example, we are we have our LGBTQ plus support group. Like we love having our, our, our queer group. We're actually opening a new one in person in New York in September. Um, but again, oh, like, you know, we're, we're opening, um, in the, the fourth quarter of this year, a support group for folks that live in larger bodies. We're opening a BIPOC support group. So we, we need those specific groups and yet how oftentimes labels can be, can be such barriers as well and can be mm-hmm. so racist, fat phobic, like, you know, um, homophobic, like we know that that labels mm-hmm. can also be hugely problematic as well. So all to say, I'm, I apologize for that long-winded answer, but all to say that- Please don't, because shitting on the DSM is one of my favorite I'm extracurricular glad. activities. <laughs> that, 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 that'll, be, that'll be episode yeah. three that we do together. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, exactly. Because I just hate that you have to fulfill certain criteria in order to be- Receive the access to care. Quote, quote unquote, worthy of care, which I think yeah, is bullshit. It's, yeah. Thank you for that. The question regarding the DSM was specifically asking of like, if there was work that the Alliance was doing to combat that and cool. like things that regular schmegular folks like us can yeah. also yeah. do. So I do know people that work on the DSM and trust me, I don't think this will come to a shock for anybody. Like I talk their ear off all the time about all the yeah. harm that's being done. <laughs> um, 
you know, but I think um, that's actually a really good advocacy. I'm going to try to figure out if we could do some type of like a writing, like writing, reaching out, cool. just mm-hmm. to be able to push the needle forward a little bit because our collective voices matter. And, yeah. you know, and mm-hmm. it's about damn time for, for individuals that don't look like, and I will name it, you know, a lot of folks that look like me should not be the center of this conversation all the time, should not be the only ones that, that get access to care. When you do that, please follow back up because the TMV community is going to yes. ride for that. I love that. Yes. I love that. Please follow back up. Please follow back up. Next question. How to put boundaries with your friends, friends, family, partners on topics to voice without feeling like you're being, they said sensitive in quotes. Mm. I think that there's not only is it being sensitive, also feeling gaslit also of like when you're, when you're having like these, these boundaries about, Hey, you know, when we're, when we're together, I would really love not to talk about diets or I would really like to not to talk about, you know, Mm. using derogatory language around, you know, mental illness, for example this is a really hard one for me because like, I, I think, I don't remember when we did it, but we, we did this like meme on the Alliance's Instagram of like, here are my boundaries. And it was like a, like a fence gate and no fence. It was just a gate. <laughs> and so it was just like a random yeah. gate. Cause like, that's how I feel like a lot yeah. of my, my um, boundaries are because yeah. I hate confrontation. I yeah. mean, I'm totally mm. that, like that proverbial ostrich in the sand where I would rather do anything than, than use my voice. Um, and say, hey, I really don't appreciate you doing X, Y, and Z because I, I, I'm so much of a people pleaser that I'm afraid of like, hey, is this going to come off? And um, one of the things that I would just share is it's okay and it's actually really important to be self-considerate of holding you and your recovery just as important as anything else. So I think mm-hmm. that there's also a way to do it. Um, and I'm sorry that I'm going to use a food, but this is like the only way that I can, I can sort of think about it is we call it like the shit sandwich or the Oreo cookie approach is like turning around and saying, you know, Hey, I love spending time with you. Like I, it just fills my cup. And when we're together, mm-hmm. if you could just not talk about a certain diet or your weight or your blah, 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 or your blah, blah, blah. Um, because I really want to be here and I want to be like connected. And mm-hmm. if they're not, you have every right to remove yourself mm-hmm. from the situation. And then when push comes to shove, you can always talk about politics that like changes the conversation and like shut, like gets everyone heated, like right away. Um, <laughs> unless it's not a safe, you know, Love unless that. it's not a safe yeah. thing to talk about. I also want to hold right, right, for right. that. But again, it's, it's, you know, for me, um, that was a, a big thing um, when my dad was still around. It's like he, even though I run an, a, an eating disorders organization, like so much of his like interaction with me was very physical, like I'm physically like commenting mm-hmm. about my weight, mm-hmm. about my skin, about my hair, about, and it was very triggering for me. Didn't matter how long, yeah. uh, how much time um, I have, I've had in recovery or living my life beyond my eating disorder it was just very triggering for me consistently mm. saying, I love you, dad. And I really don't want to be part of this conversation. And if he continued actually saying, I really can't continue to have this conversation. So I'm just going to step away. Like, so yeah. I think offering it in that like safe space of like, I really love spending time with you. And when we're together, can mm-hmm. we just, and I also want to share yeah. that it might, it might be really hard. And if those folks continue to not like hold like your boundary, like deciding whether or not it's worth being, being, um, being with them at this moment. I'm not saying black and white, Mm -hmm. like forever, Mm -hmm. but maybe in this moment, they're just not the healthiest, um, more, most supportive person for right now. Mm -hmm. Mm. I love that you always make space for the gray, Joanna. You really do. You yeah. always make space for so much nuance and gray, and, and we just <laughs> appreciate I try, it so I try. much. I mean, let me tell you, it's yeah. a whole lot of therapy that's gone on to searching for the rainbow of it all, you know? <laughs> like, Period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It shows. <laughs> it definitely shows. I finally feel free from food guilt or about the fear of certain unhealthy foods, but now I feel I eat in a really chaotic way without being conscious of what I eat for fear of being obsessive again. How do I build a healthy relationship with food while also eating well? God, I relate to that, yeah. First of all, congratulations. I think that that is phenomenal. And go you. I think anyone on any place of the journey to recovery is just a superhero and incredible. 
I think one of the things that was so important to me was to not label food as as good or bad as, um, you know, I'm eating well or not well. I think that very binary black or white, all or nothing sets you up just inevitably. One of the things that, that's so important is to just view food as food and um, not one better than the other, not doing well versus mm. not doing well. Listen, I think for so many of us, we've grown up living in a world where food has been weaponized. Food has also been a form of, you know, compensation of like, I mean, I even see it now for like my little kid that I, that I was referencing, like when she does something right, like she gets positively reinforced with, with food or with candy. And so it's this association of like, good is this, bad is this, like, so I think giving yourself grace through this whole journey and know that it's not going to be black or white or all or nothing. Um, and the more that you can get to an intuitive place, and I say that with privilege, I want to just hold that of like at the beginning, it can get very um, almost routine and mechanical. And then at some point being able to move into a, a, a space of, of um, intuition and intuitiveness but please give yourself that 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 space to not be rigid around what I'm doing is good or what I'm doing is bad. All food is food. Mm-hmm. All food is good. Um, and allow yourself space for your eating disorder to not be at the, the steering wheel of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's beautiful advice. We got another question saying someone in the recovery is looking for tips on nourishing yourself when it just feels hard. You kind of spoke to this earlier about the mechanical feelings and kind of moving through that. If you have any advice. Yeah. So when you've been engaged in an eating disorder for whether it's been a beat or a lifetime, this intuitiveness goes away, like is no longer there. It's Mm -hmm. almost like your head is one space, your body is in in another. It's, it's going to take some time for it to, to, And for some folks, I will tell you very honestly, like they might not ever fully get there. And that is okay. Like there's no, I'm like the last person that will ever be like, well, this is recovery and this is not like, we don't even have a definition Mm -hmm. for the word recovery. So let's just hold space for that for a minute. Um, But I will just say that at the beginning, and and I think (laughs) something that I'm so grateful for is this, this mechanicalness of, of, of doing it. And honestly, I was so afraid of food for so long and I was so um, dissociated from it for so long that mm. there was really nothing that really felt like I wanted. But giving yourself that space and that time to to push through the mechanical and even know that there are sometimes, I mean, I've I've been living my life beyond my eating disorder for a number of decades now. And I know that I'm a human being that's existing in life that can be stressful, overwhelming. Um and I'm a human that, you know, sometimes when I get super anxious and stressed, like m- my appetite goes away. And, but it, I also know that it's something that I can't mess around with because for me, it's a very slippery slope. So even going back to basics, like go, like thinking about like what my meal plan may have been all those years ago mm-hmm. and be like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I need to do and push through the, like that that discomfort in that time. So to the human that sent in that, that, that question, um, I totally, totally see you and I can relate to you. And I would just say, lean into the, like the mechanicalness. And I do believe that you will be able to find that hunger, satiety, that, okay, this might sound good. This might not, it will come. Um, and please don't Mm. judge yourself for not being there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. What's your take on nutritionists that specialize with eating disorders? Um, I adore dietitians that that specialize in the treatment of eating disorders. Um, cool. Some general nutritionists that have no eating disorder experience scare the crap out of me, very yeah. honestly. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not nutrition shaming at all. I love my dietitian right. friends out there, but just like with with general therapy, the treatment yeah. of eating disorders is a specialty, right? Like you mm-hmm. don't, you wouldn't go to a podiatrist to do open heart surgery. It's the same thing with, with eating disorders, mm-hmm. you know, with nutritionists, it's a lot of that, that might not have a lot of experience with eating disorders. That's here. Let's take a meal plan. These are some good foods. These are some bad foods. Let's cut the macros. Let's do this. And with folks with eating disorders, that might actually contribute to more of the obsessions and the, you mm-hmm. know, and the perseverating around food and 
also holding space for the fact that with some people with eating disorders, it might be more of a harm reduction model as opposed to a do mm. it completely this way. I adore our diet, our dietitians that work in the field. I do believe they're an integral part of the treatment process. You know, in a perfect world, which we know our world is far from perfect with only, you know, less than 30% of individuals that have um, an eating disorder getting access to care. Mm -hmm. Like, I wish that we would be able to give everyone like a therapist, a a dietitian, Mm -hmm. a psychiatrist if needed, and a primary care provider that actually had education around eating disorders. So um, huge fans of of dietitians. And if um, this goes for all disciplines, if anyone is looking to connect um, to care they can call our helplines. Um, we have amazing specialized um, clinicians that work with eating disorders that answer the phones that can help connect you to care. And then we have our find ED help uh, search mechanism yeah. that, that folks can look from insurance, where they, they live, what kind of treatment they need. Um, so yeah. I've used it for clients and it's abundantly helpful. Thank you. I love and it. we're going I through a lot of changes with it. So hopefully um, one of the like most exciting things that we're adding to it is on the clinician side, we're adding an opportunity for providers to share their lived experience cool. just to give give individuals that are looking yeah. for, for um, a therapist that has mm-hmm. that same lived experience. Yeah. So yeah, so that's coming down the pike. Oh, that's so exciting. And we have to, well, obviously at the end too, we'll make sure we cover all the amazing community yes. groups that you have. You have so many free support groups like We'll make sure everyone knows all the different tools and resources they have through you. Somebody asked how to achieve body neutrality. Don't think I can get to body positivity. Body positivity for so many folks seems just not attainable, right? Like, and um, one of my one of my dear friends, their name is Bethany C. Myers. They founded uh, the Become Project. They actually just had a book come out on Tuesday, all about body neutrality. And they're, it's fantastic. They are fantastic. I love them so much. Um, But their take on body neutrality is I don't have to love my body every day. I don't have to hate my body every day. And I just need Mm. to to respect my body every day. Mm. Body neutrality seems a lot more attainable for a lot of folks, very honestly, Mm. is, you know, I, I, I don't know about about the both of you, but I remember, you know, when I would sit there and like my therapist would be like, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to do positive like affirmations. We're going to have you look in the mirror and say, and I was like, literally, no, like I was just like, absolutely not. Like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to look in the mirror and say, I love myself or that I, whatever, like it just didn't feel very, very syntonic with how I existed. Mm -hmm. And this idea mm-hmm. of that I don't have to, you know, love my body, but I just have to like exist within my body, um, yeah. was a game changer, right? Like, and yeah. again, even with body neutrality, the idea of it's not an exact thing; it's not an all or nothing, right? It's like there's like you talk about mm-hmm. that gray. I like to talk about like the rainbow, um, you know, because yeah. even though I love gray, everything in my life is gray. But like, I just <laughs> rainbows just make me so much happier. Um, mm-hmm. But it's this idea of like existing in this place of neutrality of like, I don't have to punish myself. Also, I don't have to celebrate everything amazing that my body is doing. I can just be, Mm. um, but yeah, I, I highly suggest looking into Bethany C. Myers. They are phenomenal. Whoa, cool. We're going to link their book. book. And also Gabby, you had a beautiful experience with a therapist that reframed in a similar way with your bridge statements. Oh yeah. We talked about this a long time ago, a while ago on the podcast, just the idea of bridge statements of instead of the affirmations. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of the affirmations. So like it was similar to what you were saying of like looking in the mirror and saying like, I'm beautiful and being like, that's a crock of shit. That's not how I feel today. And bridge statements from the way that they explained it to me was you can introduce the possibility of like that maybe isn't true. So you'd be like, you know, maybe I'm not the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. Like whatever Mm -hmm. it is, like maybe not. You just introduce the possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that like cracks the door open. I love, love that. My, um, so my, my kiddo has this unbelievable EQ and she, of course, she does, <laughs> no, I will yeah. tell you, she also goes to yeah. a school where they do like mindfulness and yoga. Like that's sort of like, that's where that's like her existence, right? Like, my mom oh my God, teaches Florida, like that. Yeah. Florida has I, hope. I, I know. There's a school. Wow. I'm very few and far between. Let's not go so far. Oh, but, like, yeah. um, but we were, we were in the car and I was, I think 
I, I was getting ready to do something and I was like, I, she's like, how are you feeling? Like, so how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm nervous. And like, I'm worried that I can't do this. And she goes, mama, she goes, it's the power of yet. And I was like, the, the what? And she goes, <laughs> she goes, she goes, so it's like, it's like me and tying my shoes. I don't know how to tie my shoes yet. Yet. And I was like, okay, all right. It so, truly yeah. gave me chills. Yeah. But it's like this idea of like, could we imagine like, you know, like, I'm not there yet. And it's like this idea of the bridge, right? Like if it's like you're almost yeah. like, so it's this idea of like the yet and it just, it, it's, it, it opens up that door, right? Like it yeah. just, it's not absolute. And for so mm-hmm. many of us that are experiencing eating disorders or so many other, other uh, mental health disorders, it's this all or nothing black or white. And it's either you have to be perfect or you're absolute shit. I am forever and will be a work in progress. And I, we all will. And I'm so grateful for that. Totally. Absolutely. God, the youth God I can't wait. So much hope. <laughs> Both of us. Seriously. <laughs> I'm just picturing Meadow's future child and, and your child having a play date one day. Oh, I love that. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're seriously going to babysit my kids. Probably. <laughs> That's so cute. Yeah. Okay. We have a f- couple more that we want to get through because we're just so grateful for our audience for taking the yeah. time to send in these amazing totally. questions. Someone asks, still engage in behaviors that aren't as detrimental as others just to ensure less anxiety. What are best tools to calm down to stop an engagement? Well, I think um, from a harm reduction model, go you. Seriously, amazing, amazing. I would probably just say, do you have any accountability? Like, do you you have access to a clinician? For example, if you're not able to get access to a clinician, I highly suggest coming to support groups, um, you know, being in recovery communities, finding out other, um, other tools or other ways um, that you can replace that, the the eating disorder behavior with, um, with a, with maybe a, a less maladaptive coping tool, even though we know that eating disorder behaviors are very effective. Um, You know, that's why Mm -hmm. folks have them, right? Um, So I would say definitely leaning into two communities. I think that's really big. And like, for example, a lot of times in our support groups, we'll talk about like, what are your most favorite tools? Like, and like have community members share. And also know one of the things that that was really helpful for me and other folks I've spoken to is, is actually writing a list because when that proverbial roof is on fire, you're not going to stop and be like, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to find that tool that that's going to be helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe the first one doesn't work. And the second one doesn't work. It may be the fifth one, but don't stop. The other thing that I will say, and I don't know if I've said this um, with you all before, but during our support group marathon, during that one more weekend, we had an amazing human that shared I come to group when I'm doing well. So I know how to come to group when I'm not. Mm -hmm. And it's this really beautiful way of saying like, we're not supposed to use our our coping mechanisms only when you're at a 10. Like you need to be incorporating them all the time so that when you are um, activated or, or, you know, you're feeling that Mm -hmm. or you're, you're in the midst of wanting to act out, you can just, you can just access it. And it's like, make it part of your daily routine, even if you're having the best Mm -hmm. of days, like I feel like I'm totally oversharing about my kids. So I apologize, but like she, surprise, she also has anxiety disorders, surprise. Um, (laughs) And her therapist, um, she has an amazing play therapist and like we do like grounding tools. So, you know, five things that you can see, four things that you can touch, three, you know, mm-hmm. and we do them all the time. We like do them like when we're driving to camp, we do them when we're doing stuff just so that it's part of her. Like we do snail breathing, we do box breathing, we do all of Ooh. those things. The more that you can do that, the more easily that they'll be accessible, but write them down, whether they're on your phone, whether they're in your handwriting, they're in your own handwriting. I know that for me, there's times where I know I can know all of these things, but I'll know nothing in that moment. Mm-hmm. That way you can just pick it up and read. Joanna, that is Meadow says it all Literally the time. my yeah. number one go-to tool for just all mental health challenges, the list. Mm-hmm. You have the list on your phone because when the bad day comes around and you can't even get out of bed, how are you supposed to think about what's going to help you? That's exactly right. You make yeah. the list. And then as you're watching your fun self-care vlogs or learning in your group, you just, mm-hmm. even if one doesn't sound good, but you're like, well, might as well. What? Because the other thing is coping strategies change. They do. I can have one coping strategy for a really long time and I wake up one day and I really need it and it is doing nothing for me. Nothing. So having yeah. that list and having the diversification and different ideas mm-hmm. and oh my God, it has saved me so many times. It's like one of my favorite yeah. tips and tricks to tell folks. 
and don't if it doesn't work don't get rid of it leave it totally. there because totally. like because that, that was my thing because for me I'm like if you failed me once you're out <laughs> like I, you know yeah. like, there's no room for you yeah, yeah, yeah. but then like making sure like it just didn't work in, in that time and then also yeah. not mm-hmm. not beating yourself up if it doesn't work totally totally absolutely yeah. oh my gosh so well said um our next question we I believe we spoke about in episode one but of course I'd love to cover it again is how to support a friend who's deep into an ED and getting worse? Um, well, I would say number one is learn a little bit about eating disorders because oftentimes the things that feel the most intuitive can be stuff that can be actually activating for individuals with mm-hmm. eating disorders. Like, mm-hmm. oh, you have to eat or, or you know, oh, stop eating or whatever it is. That can be really, really triggering. Your job as a loved one is not to be food police, full stop. Number two is we have really wonderful loved ones groups that are free, that they're clinician led. Please come to it. It's a space where you can learn how to, you know, how to support your your loved one. Know that if this is like a parent um, kiddo relationship, this is not your fault. Like, I mean, although families cannot cause them, I think a lot of things can contribute to them, right? Like let's hold space for that, but know that like, you know, our job is not to fix them. Like these are, these are again, like I said at the beginning, these are biopsychosocial illnesses. Mm -hmm. Also remember that your loved one, they're not going to just will their eating disorder away. It's not going to be like, well, if they try hard enough, this is not a disorder of wills. Like, cause I will tell you the folks that I work with, like they're brilliant, intelligent. They have so much, like they're so capable and they are struggling with mental illness Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, mental health, is health. It's just another arm of health, like how physical health is. So I would say equip yourself with tools to help learn. Don't engage in power battles with them. You're not going to win. Come at it from love, care, and compassion. Use Mm. I statements. You know, I'm worried. I I care. And just remind them that they don't have to do it alone. You know, offer to help them connect to a clinician if they're able to share with them resources about the Alliance or other organizations. Um, And more than anything, just remind them that they're not alone. Thank you for that. Okay. One last question for you. I've been struggling with an ED for 10 plus years. Can you ever say you're recovered? Mm. Yes. You, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to preface this by saying that I had a lot of privilege in my life. Um, I didn't have access to care for a very long time for the first decade of my recovery. I didn't receive care. Mm. And so, and then I was able to, to receive care. So I know that, that privilege, um, Mm -hmm. I would caution anyone to, to focus only on the word recovered, because to me, I really fully believe that whatever connects with you fully is, is where you should go. And that word might ebb and flow also just how like we've talked about mm-hmm. how some tools work and then they don't. Um, I do consider myself recovered. My eating disorder is no longer a part of my everyday life, except for like, I talk about it 10 hours a day. I mean, that's just really, <laughs> but it's not my experience right now. Yeah. Um, it's, I do experience um, other mental illness. Like I do have an anxiety disorder. Um, I also make myself very accountable um, but my eating, I do live my life completely beyond my eating disorder, a big part of my, of my recovery story. Mm. Um, so whether you use the word in recovery, recovered, recovering, healed, remission, whatever word, like, please know that there is hope for living your life beyond your eating disorder. I don't think about the actual, like, it's not like it's, I don't like, there's no struggle anymore to engage with symptomatology to to have this like am I going to nourish am I not going to nourish how am I going to nourish um so I do I fully do believe and I've met many individuals that are living their life beyond their eating disorders so please hold on to that hope and if you're not able to access care please reach out to us because we have a lot of contacts to individuals that providers that do sliding scale um, that offer scholarships like please let us know how we can help because I mean, episode three or four that we're going to record together is just, just about how, um, you know, treatment cannot be a luxury. It is a necessity. Um, And anyone who's struggling um, deserves access to care. We're not there, but that is probably the thing that I am most committed to working, um, at least in in my lifetime. Yeah. 
And you know, our community loves the manifestation rhetoric. So I just implore everyone to use Joanna as the most mm -hmm. like empathetic and compassionate and intelligent expander that you've ever had. Yeah. And look at her be saying she's in recovery and owning this and talking about this and use that to form new neural pathways in your brain to show you that it's possible for yourself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh my God, I can't wait till episode three and four. Come back every I know. week. I mean, I said, like, that gave me I hope. I like invited myself. You're probably like, no. No, are you yeah. kidding? No, no, the no, next no. time we'll record it in person at the UN. Like, done. <laughs> we have a, we keep getting bigger yeah. And done, bigger. Yeah. done. Yes, oh, no, for sure. Standing yes, date. I would love that. I would love that. We, oh my gosh, Joanna, yeah, you, you are the best. So Thank you so much. Thank oh you for gosh. answering these questions in the most thoughtful and compassionate and helpful way. We appreciate you Thank so much. You. I want to shout out the helpline. Yeah. I want to shout out the support yes. groups. I want to please tell everyone all the different programs that they can utilize through the Alliance. Yeah. So actually, new news is so we were typically a 9 to 530 Monday through Friday helpline um, starting July 3rd. We're a 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time helpline. Wow. Awesome. And probably in September, we're going to be a 9 to 9 Monday through Friday helpline. And then 2024, that's huge. we're going to be a seven day a week helpline. So um, and no, I've run helplines and that's a big, big deal. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, my it, my team. Really, I hope people know that that is a lot. I, yeah. I really appreciate that because like my, yeah. my my team is like we're doing what how when? exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. you're gonna I be here on the weekends to do it and I'm like sure I'll yeah. totally be here yeah also for folks to know that um the individuals that, that do referrals are licensed and specialized providers in the treatment of eating disorders so they're super helpful they're some of the most caring compassionate humans you'll ever meet uh we also have a bunch of free weekly therapist-led support groups that are both in person across the country and virtual. We currently have six virtual groups. They happen all week long, um, and we're really excited to start all of our new support groups that are coming down the pike hopefully soon. But more than anything, we're here to walk next to you on your journey to recovery. And, um, you know, just to remind you that, um, you know, this is hard. The, the journey to recovery is very hard and it's definitely not made easier by the world we live in that, you know, um, I do think episode three or four needs to be around like fat phobia and weight stigma and diet culture. Oh my God. I'd love to get into that. I mean, more and more and more and more. Like it's just, we thought that it was getting better, but it's not. So if that is what you're experiencing, please know that, that it's not something that's lost on us and, and we see you. Yeah. But we're just here. We're here to walk next to you on your journey to recovery. And um, just so grateful to the both of you just for always creating such a amazingly safe space um, and providing this for the, you know, for the community, um, our community or community, just ever so grateful. Thank you. Oh, we love you. Thank you so much for all that you do. And the Alliance is one of the best Instagram follows. <laughs> I've said it before and Such I want a good to Instagram follow. it again. Yes. One of the best Instagram followers. Everyone needs to follow them. We'll have everything linked in our show notes below. Thank you and so much, Joanna. And you'll hear from Joanna soon. Yeah, apparently. Yes. Yeah, get Clearly. Get back every day. We're yeah. just here to get shit done. <laughs> That's it. We're just going to get punch a couple gals, get shit done. Love it. A quick mic drop. <laughs> we love you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. How's it going, y'all? It's Aaron. Don't let your Monday suck. Don't have those Sunday scaries. I'm tired of everybody waking up in the week saying, ah, shit, it's Monday. You know what goes down? TMV releases every week on Mondays. Make sure you rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're watching YouTube, yes, TMV has a YouTube. Be sure to subscribe and ring that noti bell and never miss a thing. And also, join the TMV familia by joining the Thoughts May Vary Patreon and by following at Thoughts may vary pod on Instagram and TikTok. Thank you for listening. Great. There you go. Thanks, baby. Gotcha.